Hi, boys and girls. It's Mrs. Marburger. Um, I am reading this to you in the middle of one of our storms, and we actually lost power. So that's why it's so dark in here. I apologize. Um, but I'm still going to do it. You don't really need to see my face that well, right, to listen to this story. So we are up to chapter 23. And it looks like we are back to Pax. Okay. The moon shone through the trees as full and creamy yellow as the eggs Pax had eaten a week before. His stomach cramped as he paced the river's edge. Only three times in the week and a half since his humans had left him had he eaten a meal big enough to fill his belly. And the last one, a pile of fish rotting on the bank, he had retched up minutes later. He had retrieved the catched ham and watched with pride as Bristle and Runt ate the meat, but he hadn't touched any of it. And he still had no luck hunting. All of his fat reserves were gone, his coat hung loose, and he was burning muscle. Pax trained his nose to the human's camp, which, as always, tortured him with his rich food scents. Over the past two days, more war sick had arrived, and hundreds of them were massing to the south beyond. The ground vibrated with their threat, but Pax was hungry. He looked over to where Bristle was guarding the sleeping runt and signaled that he would leave. Although he could see the camp directly above him, he chose his old route, up the gorge and across the ridge, because the guards on the wall were facing the river. He padded up the rocks into the water, leaving no tracks. Away from the silence of the devastated field, his ears pricked toward the night sounds. He knew them now. They comforted him. The thin piping of bats, the careless crashing of a waddling skunk, the underground bustle of the voles, and the distant calls of owls. All these sounds told him that he was not hunting alone. Pax himself made no noise. He had learned the secrets from the stealth, gray, and bristle. Like a shadow, he slipped across the ridge, down the hill, and into the grub tent. No easy meat hung this night, but the tables were piled high with vegetables and bread. He knocked a wheel of cheese on the ground. The taste was strong and strange, but he gulped until his belly stretched tight. As he headed back out, carrying a hunk for bristle, a familiar scent stopped him in his tracks, peanut butter. It was drifting out of a large metal can. Pax dropped the cheese. He stood to sniff at the rim. Like the garbage bin at his boy's home, the can promised a variety of scraps, but above the scents rose the one he craved more than any other. His whiskers ruffled in pleasure and he nudged the lid aside a few inches. The clear jar lay on top of the heap its sides still smeared thick with creamy prize. Pax edged his snout under the lid and bit the top rim carefully. He knew from experience that this was how to grip the jar so it didn't cover his nose. He pushed away from the garbage can and the lid clattered to the stony ground, ringing an alarm in the quiet night. Pax ducked under the table and froze. His pulse quickened. Across the tent, the flap snapped open a human stepped in and clipped on a beam of light. Even over the peanut butter, Pax recognized the scent. It was his boy's father. Pax raised a paw, ready to dart in whatever direction seemed safe. The man swept the light around the tent, and when it fell on Pax's eyes, he winced, but he didn't move. His pupils adjusted, and Pax saw the man crouch to stare at him. Pax remained frozen, paw still raised, Jar still clamped to his jaws, studying the man's face as the man studied his. The man grunted, rubbing his chin, and then he gave a rough laugh. Pax lowered his paw an inch, holding the man's gaze, testing him. His boy's father laughed again and then rose and lifted the tent flap. He kicked his boot through the opening. Pax knew the signal. The man had used it on him often at the door of the human's house at the door of his pen. Go through, it meant. Go through right now and I won't harm you. The pact was reliable. Pax sped past him into the safety of the night. He didn't slow down until he reached the spine of the hill. 
He buried the jar and then crouched to watch for movement at the camp in the pre-dawn light. Although he was certain no humans had followed him, he took off east, snaking a loop for half an hour before doubling back to drop down to the river. Runt was awake when Pax returned, and for the first time since the explosion, he was struggling to rise. Bristle urged him back down. But Pax saw that his lips were cracked and his eyes sunken. He needs water. Bristle looked to the river's edge. A dozen full bounds for a healthy fox. Would it even be possible for Runt? The little fox braced his forelegs. He tightened his haunches to rise and then looked back in surprise. The leg that had been part of him his whole life, as much a part of him as his own scent, it was gone. He bent and sniffed at the wound. He looked up at Pax and then Bristle as if searching for an explanation. <clears throat> so he did lose a leg. Again, he strained upwards. His one remaining back leg jacked him up and Runt rolled to his wounded haunch with a yelp of pain. Pax leaped to stand by his injured side. Runt got to his front legs once more and then straightened his one back leg. Again, he canted over. This time though, he fell against the strong, tall flank of the older fox and he did not cry out. He wobbled, searching for a new balance. And when he found it, Pax took a single step toward the water and then waited. Runt stepped out, first the front two legs, then a dragging hop with a single back leg, and a collapse again against Pax. Again, Pax took a single step, and again the small fox matched it, and again, and once more, until he didn't waver at all. Bristle ran ahead to the bank and stepped by a wounded step. Runt closed the distance until he flopped down by the riverbank and stretched his neck out to lap up the cool water. And when he was seated, he dropped his head, closing his eyes, but Bristle nipped him. Soon it would be full daylight. He would be exposed. She ran up river to a stand of cattails. Runt limped after her. He was still clumsy and trembling and slow, but he did not fall once. Pax followed close by, and just as they reached the stand of reeds, Pax startled at the crackling of brush from downstream. Bristle's head snapped around too ears cocked to the same spot across the river. Something large was coming. Runt dipped his head to sniff at a snail. Pax and Bristle backed into the cattail reeds. Bristle called her brother, but Runt did not turn his head. A buck pranced out of the vegetation, tossed his antlers, and then splashed into the river. Bristle barked for her brother again, and again he ignored her. The deer clattered up onto the other bank heading for the bright grass of an unscorched area of field, and at its edge he lifted a hoof. As he set it down, the earth rocked and the bright grass blew. The buck burst up, his back twisting and snapping. Runt screamed his terror at the quaking ground. Bristle and Pax herded him into the cool dark of the reeds and soothed him until he understood that he was unharmed. The foxes watched the soldiers run down the hill, sweep their beam of light over the heap in the field, and then go back. As a pink sun rose over the pines, vast patches of grass in the field flared up and crackled. Field mice stumbled out toward the cool safety of the riverbank. Dazed and disoriented, they would have made easy meals, but Bristle let them pass, as if obeying some code that protected those so terrified. She stood and gazed over the smoking field. We have to leave here, now. Pax knew that she was right. He followed her out of the reeds. Bristle called to Runt, who was watching and wondering, watching a wondering bull, and he didn't even flick his ears toward his sister. And then Pax understood. He can't hear. Do you remember how Pax was deaf right after the explosion, but his hearing came back? Well, the same thing happened to Runt. But for Runt, his hearing didn't come back. That's why he wasn't responding to his sister. And that is the actually the end of chapter 23. I think I'm going to continue on to chapter 24 because I do want to get this book done. 24 is a little long. We'll see how far we get. When Peter came into the kitchen, he found Vola already drinking coffee. She couldn't have slept any more than he had. 
He had heard her leave for the barn in the middle of the night, and she hadn't come back until nearly dawn. She raised her mug. Breakfast before you go? He shook his head. Bola nodded and took his pack from him. She stuffed a brown paper bag into it. Eat the ham sandwich first, because ham won't keep. There's a jar of salve. Put it on twice a day. I filled your thermos, but you'll have to be on the lookout for springs. Keep that cast dry, though. I am mean it. Tear a garbage, tape a garbage bag around it if it rains. She set the pack down, and Peter noticed she had two shoes on. Hey, you're wearing it. She lifted her overall cuff. Condition number one. Oh, remember Peter said she had uh, three conditions she had to follow for him to stay that extra night? So that was one, that she had to wear her actual prosthetic leg. Wow, Peter managed after a minute. Holy Dibelman, where's the old one? Bola tipped her head to the armchair. I don't know what to do with it. Maybe put it on the scarecrow? Not on the scarecrow, Peter answered, instantly sure. He pointed to the fireplace. The phoenix, remember? All his stuff burns up in the nest. Bola sighed, but she followed him. Peter stirred the embers and added some kindling. Bola brought the wooden post over. It looked smaller somehow. The leather straps reminded Peter of the ones binding the marionette's feet and hands. You okay? I'm okay. Bola placed the wooden leg onto the flames, and both of them watched until it caught. Peter noticed how smooth her gait was with the prosthetic. You wouldn't even guess it. She pulled the screen over the fire, and when she got home today, there'd be nothing but a pile of ashes. Are you okay with the other two conditions, he asked, trailing her into the kitchen. We'll find out at the library, but I loaded the tractor already. The tractor? How else are we going to cart 20 marionettes to town? We're driving to the library on a tractor? We're driving to the library on a tractor, unless you've got a magic carpet that you haven't told me about. And we have to leave soon to make that the bus. We'll have to leave soon to make that bus. So are you ready? Yeah, I've got everything I need. Well, not quite you don't. She reached behind the door and drew out something that surprised Peter so much that he couldn't even respond. You know what it is, right? The baseball bat was turned perfectly smooth, the weight so solid and balanced that the world seemed to slow as he hefted it. You made this, but I don't need. Well, I think you do. Maybe when you get where you're going, you'll figure out why. Peter ached to hand the bat back, but Bola had stayed up late last night carving it for him, and she looked so proud. Maybe it was time to own one again. He balanced on his crutches and took a slow motion swing, and the other bad memory swept him. His seven-year-old fury, a wildness he couldn't control, the exhilarating fright of that wildness, his mother's blue gazing glow, batted off the pedestal on into a million shards and her tears. You've got to tame that temper. Don't be like him. Her bloodied fingers pricking the blue glass daggers from her white roses. His shame as he watched her drive away. He slid the bat into his pack where it fit as though it had always had a place there. Treacherous. Treacherous means like dangerous. He hoisted the pack and underneath was the newspaper clipping. He picked it up, and his eye caught the date. He crumpled it to the chair, gut kicked. What? He knew. Peter shoved the clipping across the table. He knew? This is 12 days old, so my father knew this when we left Pax. It hurt to take a breath, like knives to his lungs. When I asked to leave Pax on that old mill road because... It would be safe there, he knew. Peter's hand bur hands burned. He looked down. They were balled into tight fists, and he forced them open. How could he have done that? Bola came over, eyeing him carefully. I'm sorry, that's a very bad thing. His jaw clenched. Could teeth shatter? He forced open. How could anyone have done that? 
I know you're angry. Peter's fists had balled up again, the nails gouging his sore palms. He jammed them between his knees. No, I told you, I don't get angry. I'm not like him. I won't be like him. Bola sat down across from him. Oh, I see. I see now. But I don't think that that's going to work out. You're human, and humans feel anger. Not me. It's too dangerous. Bola threw back her head and barked her startling laugh. Oh, let me tell you, feelings are all dangerous. Love, hope, ha, hope. You talk about dangerous, huh? No, you can't avoid any of them. We all own a beast called anger. It can serve us. Many good things can come of anger at bad things. Many unjust things are made just. But first, we all have to figure out how to civilize it. Peter felt his wiring begin to snap. Just one time, could you not tell me I have to figure something out? Just once, would it kill you to help? Come on, I'm leaving. You've got all this. He waved his hand up the bulletin board. This wisdom here. Would it kill you to send me off with some advice? What, you want me to give you a philosophy bingo card for your trip? Like when you smell honey in the woods run because the bear can't be far behind? Well, yeah, I guess, but for real. Well, for real, I don't have any magic truth guide for you. It's your trip, not mine. But now that you bring it up, I do have a card for you. She pulled one off the board and handed it over. It's blank. Well, it is now, but a trip like this, you'll find something to fill it with. A truth of your own that you discover on your own. And at that, Peter felt suddenly exhausted, as if he had been holding himself rigid for years. He had been on his own for so long. Bola studied him. Oneness is always growing in the world, boy. Two, but not two, it's always there, connecting its roots, humming. I can't be part of it. That's the price I pay for taking myself away. But you can be. You can vibrate with its heartbeat. You may be on your own. You may be on your own, but you won't be alone. But what if I get lost? You will not get lost. Oh, I think I already am. Bola reached out across the table, cupped his head, and pressed. No, you are found. She got up, and Peter felt her brush a kiss on his hair as she passed. So she, like, kind of like a mother would, kind of cupped his heads, and then as she was walking away, she gave him a little kiss on the top of his head. She, I think she really cares for him like a mother would, right? The tractor wasn't actually that uncomfortable, but it was slow and bumpy and loud, too loud for them to talk easily, even though Peter was sitting right next to Vola. That was okay with him, though. He had a lot to think about. Even after they turned onto the smoother highway shoulder, Vola was quiet, and Peter figured she had things on her mind. But when she pointed at a hawk wheeling overhead, he remembered something he had always wanted to ask. What is it with you and birds and the feathers? Vola patted the feathers on her rawhide necklace and smiled. T pow. When I was born, I reminded my parents of a bird. My hair stuck up like feathers, and I had a scrawny neck, and I squawked for food all the time. I'm part Creole, part Italian, and part a dozen other things. But all people who revered birds in their cultures, my parents realized. So they named me Vola. It means fly in Italian. But they call me Tipao, little chicken. My chickens grace me with feathers, and I wear them to remember that when I was born, someone saw me as a bird. That's all. Not much of a story. But it was a good story, Peter thought, and it explained the look that she always got on her face when she lifted the rock. It would be the hardest for her to give away. He looked behind him at the four crude pine crates that the marionettes were packed in, strapped to the back. Peter hoped they didn't remind Bola of coffins. Her amazing puppets were going to live now, really live, out in the real world, not just exist to perform as some kind of penance. And maybe Bola would too. Maybe that, maybe that was too much to ask, though. 
He was still wondering about that when the tractor sputtered to a stop in the library parking lot, conquering over three spaces. Ole climbed down and hoisted one of the boxes. Peter followed, but as the wide brick steps at the wide brick steps, he stopped and tapped Bola's shoulder. You know, he whispered, you have to be a little careful in there. Careful? About language, you know. Bola looked at him blankly. He was going to have to spell it out for her. It isn't the kind of place where people say diablemen a lot. Oh, please. I think I know that boy. So I'm going to take a second to explain that um, Bailey had asked me a question about what that word meant. And it's just like another word for devil. It's considered a not a very nice word. So uh, I think it's in Creole when I looked it up. Um, so that's why he says you have to watch your language because saying that in a library, some people might be offended by it. The librarian looked like a tossed handful of jewels, bright coral scarf, silk blouse, sapphire blue skirt. She smiled as Bola came in and set her crate on the table. And when the top was lifted, her mouth fell into a perfect O. Peter remembered he had been speechless too the first time he had seen those puppets, and he backed out the door to give Bola some privacy. The morning's clouds had lifted and the sky was so bright that it hurt his eyes. The sound seemed brighter than usual, too. Or maybe it was just because things had been so quiet this past week. A barking dog, two women chatting, bike brakes squealing, children shrieking in a playground beside the park. He had missed these sounds, and he had missed the world. He wondered if Vola had missed it all this time. He headed over to watch the little kids playing for a few minutes. Most of them were tearing around, jumping onto and off of benches and slapping the swings in some kind of made-up game. A frowning girl with a straw-colored ponytail was digging by herself in the sandbox, earnestly moving shovelful after shovelful from one pile to another. Sitting on the sandbox corner, looking bored, with his head propped in a small in a baseball glove, was a boy in a faded red t-shirt. It was the shortstop from the ball practice. Do you guys remember that kid that he tried to talk to? Peter moved closer. Hey! The boy looked up and stood, as if readying for a fight. He nodded at Peter's crutches. I wondered why you didn't show up. How did you do? The shortstop scoffed. <laughs> like you don't know you creamed us. He took the little girl's shovel and handed her a pink sweatshirt. Come on, let's go home. Wait! Peter felt a crazy rising panic. Maybe being a hermit for a week had made him weird already. But the boy was lifting his sister out of the sandbox and they were going to leave and he couldn't let that happen yet. Wait, you know when you're on the field and you know what you're supposed to do and you're ready and when the game's about to start and the glove turns into part of your hand and you know exactly where you should be, you know that feeling? Do you think that's peace? The boy scowled at Peter. He shook his head as if he wanted to shake off the whole encounter. And then he started walking away, pulling his sister by the hand. Peter could only watch as they left the playground, feeling that something valuable had just slipped away. But at the gate, though, the shortstop turned. He was pretty far away, but it looked like maybe he wasn't frowning anymore. He lifted a hand and shot two fingers up in a peace sign, and Peter lifted his own two fingers back. Inside, the librarian was unpacking the last crate. Half a dozen kids had materialized, and they gasped and grinned as she lifted out each marionette. Bola stood off to the side, watching. She turned to leave when she caught sight of Peter. I'm going to stop right there. How do you think Bola is feeling, seeing the reaction of the librarian, and then all of the kids gasping and mouths gaping open as they look at these amazing creations that she made. I bet she is so, so proud. Peter stabbed out a crutch to block her. Condition number three, he reminded her. He glanced back to the librarian. Bully gave him a look that was half irritation, half grudging defeat. So she turned back to the librarian. I forgot to say, B, that I'll come back once a week to teach the kids how to use them.
B. Booker smiled, a slow smile that reminded Peter of melted caramel. That would be awfully nice. Bola set out for the door, but Peter blocked her path again. Bola threw her palms up. What now? He raised two fingers. What? Oh, for... Ugh, fine. She walked back to the table. B, twice a week. I'll come twice a week to teach the kids. The librarian broke out into a wide grin. The children would love that. Be good to see you here more often, too, Vola. Maybe we could go for that coffee afterwards. A little girl with a fountain of feed pigtails tugged on Vola's overalls, and she pointed to the elephant. How do you make him dance? She demanded. Peter held his breath, but instead of lecturing the girl about figuring things out for herself, Vola crouched down to study the elephant. Peter noticed that the movement was smoother with the prosthetic. She had an ankle joint now, such a simple thing to be able to flex. How much had she given up? What makes you think he wants to dance? Vola asked. Red toenails like mine, the little girl wiggled her toes in her sandals, and then her hand drifted up to stroke the feathers at Vola's neck. Vola, startled. Vola was startled at the touch, and Peter held his breath again but she only reached out and patted the girl's own necklace of yellow pop beads. Then she pointed to the clock over the desk, which read almost 11. I've got something important to do right now, but I'll be back in a half hour. If you're still here, we'll figure out how to make him dance. Wow, that's a huge step for Vola. By the time they grabbed Peter's pack and crossed the street, the bus was already idling at the station. While Vola went to the ticket counter, Peter made his way to the group waiting to board. A shiver of current scurried up his spine. It was the same thrill that juiced him every time. An umpire called, play ball. Vola handed Peter the ticket. Lying it in his hand, it looked so small for the power that it contained. I'm going to get there and I'm going to find him. Thank you. The bus door cranked open and Vola leaned in. She pointed a warning finger at the driver. Robert, this boy is family. He's been visiting and now he's going home, so you see that he gets there safe and sound. She stepped away and an elderly couple began their shaky climb aboard. Peter shifted his backpack and crutches. He took a step towards the bus and then he turned back. I'm family? That's as true a thing as I've ever known. Now get on that bus. The steps were tall, but Peter hoisted himself up with ease. He took a seat up front and gave Vola a thumbs up through the grimy glass. He was strong now. He was prepared. But when the air brakes hissed their release, he gripped the armrest. It was going to hurt a lot to watch her get smaller and smaller. Vola motioned for him to slide to the window and open it when the bus growler growled into gear. Boy, she called up as it lurched away from the curb. I'm going to leave the porch door open for you. Oh my gosh. I know that was really long. This was like a half an hour read for these two chapters. But how amazing. What a transformation Vola is going through. And I'm really sad because I know she's sad that he's leaving. But I have a feeling he might be back. Because I think he cares about her too. I think he does believe that they're family now, just like she does. Okay, I'll see you next time.